good. Yeah, I have no. Yeah, sorry. Just yeah, we are gonna we're recording this. I think just just in case anyone oh, yeah. doesn't want to be recorded. Oh, all right. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure how long to wait. Really, I don't know what this could be. Us, couldn't it? Should yeah. we? Uh, should we start with some some quick introductions? I think I think we were we were brief to ask you um, where where who you are, where you're from, why you're here, what what your interest is. So, oh, we got Amy as well. Hey, Amy. So start with you, Amanda. So I just go around my screen. It's just easier. Yeah. It? <laughs> <laughs> I was just trying to find the appropriate notebook because I have about 20 by my side. <laughs> I was just like, I need the right notebook. Right. So, um, hi, I'm Amanda. I'm in Lancaster in the Northwest. I know Chris and Glyn through the Centre for Welfare Reform. I'm one of the fellows there. And I'm um, a sort of uh, consultant in adult social care and health and my passion is inclusion equality learning disability yeah i don't know how to summarize <laughs> i don't want to go on too long yeah. oh, thank you uh daniel hi everyone i'm dan um i work for nesta we're an innovation foundation and i lead uh, a team called the people powered results team that is all around trying to put uh, power back into the hands of people that use services and frontline practitioners as a way to drive systems change and systems reform. Um, easier said than done, I guess. Uh, I'm here because I think we just need to get to grips with social care and actually rethink a bit imaginatively about what the future looks like for the system, for people within the system and kind of for future generations. <clears throat> Thanks, Daniel. That's cool. Uh, Diana? Yeah, I'm Diana. Um, I'm a, a volunteer with various organisations. Um, I'm a governor for Ardash. I'm, my passion is sort of um, attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder and comorbid conditions. Um, so essentially what was called hidden impairments. Um, I'm interested in co-production co of services um, and so like social care and, and health care working closer together so that you get a proper service rather than a fragmented you know bits here and bits there and then you know people are falling through the gaps so yeah that's me basically Brilliant. thanks Daniel uh, Sandra Hi, I'm a bit of a, an interloper here. Um, I run a small charity working in the criminal justice sector, um, uh, uh, primarily focusing on young offenders, uh, but we're also, um, well, obviously the overlap between health, social care, criminal justice, we don't have to uh, spell it out. Uh, we're trying to work, develop working with, uh, partnership working with um, uh, a quite, quite small uh, mm. <clears throat> social care charity who also share an interest in, in this sector to um, develop co-production and family-centred family wraparound services for young people involved in the criminal justice system that gives them um, the opportunity to find an exit route. Yeah. Uh, Meg? <clears throat> Hi, I'm from Cambridge. I'm from, I don't know if I'm, I'm probably a massively big interloper. I'm from Transition Cambridge. I'm like the, the social justice advocate in the organisation, I think. I used to be a social worker in adult social care until I couldn't bear it anymore. Um, and I just got a job as um, a support worker in um, horticultural therapy. Um, and I'm just really interested in what you've got to say. So thank you for having me. Great. Yes, nice to have you here. Uh, Sylvia. Um, yes, I'm, I'm here because um, from Ludlow in Shropshire, um, there is an association called Hands Together. Um, does a number of things really and particularly has become much more important during the period of the pandemic because as we all know there are many people who live virtually on their own and of course 
became extremely isolated during the pandemic. So um, there were teams set up to one-to-one -to -one befriending with the aim now of, uh, as we're moving away from the pandemic, is to bring people together. There's been some, uh, there's, there's, there are places in, in Ludlow where there have been meals provided um, as a method of bringing people together and talking. Um, meals were provided and handed out individually during the uh, pandemic, but we've got probably a bit of a problem on our hands with elderly people who've got completely used to living entirely on their own, but are very lonely and often very distressed about that. And we have to basically try and bring them together more, make them feel part of the town and get, get to know each other better. It's fairly simple really, <laughs> but difficult. <laughs> That's great. That's the, uh, um, Amy? Hi, um, I'm currently working for a project called Together for Change based down in Pembrokeshire and we're working to support community-led action across the county and at the moment we're working to understand and how to support the well-being of communities and especially coming out of the pandemic. It's nice to meet you all. Brilliant. Yeah, lovely to have you all here. Um, so I think in terms of the order, uh, we're going to go back, I think, and we're going to feed back um, what we talk about. Is there, Are there any willing volunteers who want to sort of take some notes and feedback to the group? Can we introduce ourselves, please? Yeah, we do. Yeah, we're, well, I was going to say, okay, so I'll, ta I'll try and take some notes anyway. Um, what we've got, I'll put the slide up, Glenn, so I've got your slide that you wanted me to put up. Um, and then we're going to, I think we're just going to do a few slides and then I think we're just going to have a bit of a general, general chat really. So I'll, um, I'll just go to our slideshow. Uh, hopefully this works. You see that, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we've done that first one. So that's good. There you go. Hello, everyone. Oh, is it me to talk now? It is you, Glenn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I apologise. I, I need, I need direction. <laughs> yeah, sorry, mate. Yeah, yeah, go for it. <laughs> so, if we take a slide down, take a slide down. I just like to talk to people. I like to see people. Hello, everyone. My name is Glenn. Uh, I'm a, I'm a peer supporter. I'm a person with lived experience being in mental health services for over forty years. I, uh, with personality disorder, autism, I've also got long-term conditions, uh, sleep apnea, asthma, diabetes, and I also care for my mum with schizophrenia, and also my partner with uh, long-term uh, psychotic depression. But recently, my brother now, who's, who's got brain damage, and Charles Bonnet syndrome through COVID. What I'm talking about today is the power of peace support and the power of connections. And what we did in that little two minutes just then, we talked to each other. We had a conversation. We walked beside each other. We didn't, we didn't drag each other behind us. And we didn't walk in front. We, we had a meeting of minds. We connected. We delivered uh, our stories. We delivered our narrative. We listened to people. How we change, how do we change society? How do we change social care? How do we change our communities? How do we invest in people? We invest in people by listening to them, by allowing them to tell, tell us their narrative, tell us their story, letting them know that they're important. I've been addicted to drugs, I was 17 years on drugs. Uh, uh, I'm now 17 years clean off drugs. I was an, uh, an alcoholic, I would, uh, I'm now 12 years clean from alcohol. I've been in services for over 30 years. I never recovered a single day in services. I recovered when I was accepted by my community, by the people in my community, by, the, by hope, by support, by peer support, people helping people. I went, when I were accepted, well, people brought back from the edge of society back into the centre. These are the ways that we save money. How do we save services money? How do we 
how do we uh, support one another? We support one another by acknowledging that every person within our community, within our services, are assets. We have to look at a strengths-based model about, about what people can offer. We don't, and what, what, what gifts and skills that people have. We don't come from a medical model saying, what's your diagnosis? What's wrong with you? Because that just turns people off straight away. It's about what can I contribute to my society? What can I, communi what can I communicate and give to the people around me? What is my sense of purpose? And I believe it's a hard job for the people who've been written it off in society like myself with multiple disabilities who've gone through traumatic times in mental health services and institutions and learning disability services and, and drugs and alcohol services and police, police services and all the other institutions that says I'm not good enough. I'm not wanted. I am a problem within the service. Unless I join a group with eight people in it, I'm surplus to requirements. Unless I uh, keep my mouth shut and not put my head about paraport and ask, not ask questions, then I'm out. These are the sorts of services that traumatise people day in, day out. What peer support does, pe what, what the people focus groups that I'm part of, I've been part of it six years, I've not once relapsed of drugs. I've not once relapsed of alcohol. I've not been back into the criminal justice system. I've not caused problems or antisocial behaviour within my community. When I used to walk down the street, it was like partying at Red Sea. Everybody used to disperse because I were an absolute nightmare. I were an absolute nightmare because I didn't know any different. I'd not been given the skills or, or the qualities or the understanding how to behave in society. I didn't know what it, what, what it meant to be human. I was dragged in and out of care, in and out of hospital, in and out, in and out of institutions where people didn't even call me my name by day by day. It was him, her, stand up, sit down, take these tablets, wear this, get up. I was told what to do in institutional lines every single day. I didn't know where I started and services began. But what peer support did, people in, 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 the, in my community, they said, what do you want, Glyn? What, what are your dreams? What are your ambitions? What are your hopes? I couldn't even read and write while I was 36. I couldn't even read and write. I went to, I been through with my community. I went to learn to read and write, read and write, read and write first. I, I, I become empowered within my own life. To enable people to become empowered in their, in their own lives is the most beautiful thing that you can do for, some, for someone, give, about giving them a voice. So we, we in PFG now, we have groups of six of people that meet and they, uh, uh, so they go, uh, people go out on boat trips, they go uh, in cooking lessons, they're doing sign language together, uh, they're going to meet and greet, they do on walking groups. It's about getting people together with the same skills, interests and hobbies and enabling them to create, uh, create happiness, create, create well-being, create health looking at each other uh, with coping mechanisms, how they cope with their symptoms and experiences and instead of knocking down the hospital door or the crisis team door, saying, I manage it this way, uh, can you help me to understand the way you manage it? I have suicidal thoughts. I have suicidal thoughts every day. It doesn't mean I'm suicidal, but I have suicidal visualisation. And every day I will, I'll ring it crisis team four and five a day, times a day because of my thoughts. But what peer support does, what people... People helping people do what the power of the PFG does is get people like me together and we help each other to self manage our conditions. We help each other to manage our diabetes. We help each other manage our asthma. We help each other to manage all the other long term conditions that we would normally turn up at the hospital or hospitals or, or AE for or GPs for. We would cost money to services. So we saved, this, through, through the power of peace support, we saved the NHS and the front end of services thousands and thousands of pounds. We have, a three, we have got over 3,000 members now who give and receive peer support, who help one another day in, day out, who give the greatest possession that anybody can give away their time. Like you're giving me your time today. And I just thank you very much from the bottom of my heart for allowing me to share my story with you. Because this in itself right now is recovery for me. 
So I was on my knees crying out to God to kill me. I took enough drugs to kill an elephant. I didn't know where I were. I'd lost all my family. I'd lost my kids. I lost my home. I was in debt up to my eye holes. And today, through the power of peer support, I'm living in the community, in my own home, not in any debt, not under any mental health services. Uh, and I'm, and I'm, I'm empowered by my community who support me day in, day out. And my, my package alone within services must have cost hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pounds a year. And that's not including time that I was, got, used to get locked up, being something from a shop, sit outside a shop, get locked up, because it was safer in the cells. And then nobody were covered in, in my room at night to abuse me. So I used to just pin something and sit outside the shop to get locked up because it was safer for me. So I've gone through sexual abuse, physical abuse, and all, all the other mental health issues that I've got. And the thing is, we've met with peer support, talking to people with like, -mind, like minded people as yourself, who can help you understand you. Because the biggest thing that I'd lost were my identity. I didn't have an identity. I didn't know where I started and mental health services began. I didn't know where I started and physical health or abuse began. But what 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 enabled but what, what peer support enabled me to do is find myself. It's become one with myself. Is 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 be one accepted by my community. I didn't want to cause into social behaviour anymore. I didn't want to cause any problems with my community. I wanted to give back to my community. I wanted to spend time with people in my community to help them like they help me. And I think when you find that, when you I call it finding your North Star, when you find your purpose in life, the thing that you'll get who, who, who makes you jump out of bed and want to help and want to support someone is the greatest thing that you can ever have. It's easy to give when you don't expect anything in return. And that's the greatest thing about giving. Giving with the community, people helping people, is about you giving what you want. There's no expectation to when you have to be up or at a place or when you have to give your support, it's up to you. But that can, that saves thousands of thousands of pounds of local authority and thousands of thousands of pounds we in community services. So thank you everyone. Thanks, Glenn. Thanks for sharing the story, Glenn. Really powerful. Powerful. Amazing. It's very hard to follow that. So um, I'm going to have to use slides because I am just terrible at remembering things. So um, if you're all right, I shall just share my screen again. Um, so uh, my bit, I think, is going to be, we're going to be talking about... Um, Obviously, social care and some some innovations in social care and how we can probably how we hopefully can transform how some of this um, how how some of what we know is not working about the system um, and try and turn things around a little bit. So, just saying a little bit about me because um, I've been obviously a bit of a social care nerd. I've worked I've supported people really since I was eighteen. So I came out of college and I started working with people with learning disabilities in NHS inpatient units, and these were guys labelled as couldn't live in the community. You know, they were too complex, too challenging, this kind of stuff. Um, so that was my kind of grounding. And, and, you know, it was delightful. I had a lovely time working with people. They're amazing. They're just amazing characters. And, um, and after a couple of years that being in that institutional environment, I got a bit ground down with it. And I just couldn't, I couldn't keep working there, basically, because of these amazing people. And the institution itself was the problem. People couldn't go out. They were, there wasn't enough staff. The building, you know, they had a choice. It was like hospital food coming down from the hospital. Um, you know for lunch breakfast that kind of stuff and people were getting angry and agitated about that and, and the thing is it wasn't them it was that setting that they were in basically and I could see in my brain I said why would you know what I was a young lad I didn't really get it at the time to be honest with you I just thought I've got to get out of it this is horrible this isn't how we should be working with people really um, so I spent a few years working in community-based settings really working with people in their own homes working in group living environments what uh, supported some older people did like, quite a lot of kind of support work stuff really um, and then luckily i was kind of lucky to get involved in working with local authorities and we did some work around partnership boards and how we could bring the voice of people and communities into into local government into the, into those institutions really to try and do some transformation um and then i spent a few years helping people escape from 
assessment and treatment units basically we closed down a load of them and we moved everybody out and again these were the guys that were labeled as couldn't live in the community so it's it and you know probably 99 out of 100 of those individuals had a really good has got a really good life still in the community with their own bespoke support package around them so we kind of so all through my career i've kind of been quite into like how we get rid of institutional thinking and transfer power and control to individuals and communities basically um so i was quite lucky i met simon Duffy in 2015 uh, you know he, he, I'd read his work you know in 2003 with with the keys to citizenship so I was kind of au fait with some of these concepts and they were kind of like a guiding light a bit like Glenn was saying his North Star for me was this 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 concept of keys and allow, and letting people have good lives basically and allowing people to, to design their own lives um, so we did some individual service fund stuff I was working in local authorities so we tried to open it up to people and I'll cover what individual service funds are in a minute but basically it's flexible funding um, so I've now got our company, I guess, is self-directed futures. We're a part of the Centre for Welfare Reform. So we're set up as a social enterprise and we donate um, we donate part of our profit to the centre to keep the centre running, basically. So the consultancy work we do kind of runs in and funds that. Um, I also do some work running what we call a micro-enterprise in Dorset, which is a small organisation supporting people with learning disabilities. Um, so I still do, you know, kind of hands-on stuff as well, really. I think that's really important. Um, and I do some other work um, as an associate for other consultancies. But... Um, so the first thing is, I think I know we're, this is a bit of a sales pitch, I think. So um, Centre for Welfare Reform, obviously we're consultants, we're part of that. Um, the centre's growing its offer around consultancy, we, mainly because of we want to change things. You know, it's not, none, nobody I think in the centre has gone into the centre as a fellow or to do consultancy stuff, um, you know, to make money. It's actually because we're passionate about and we believe in stuff and we want to actually, we want to be able to give them, you know, the opportunity to do that really. So, um, so we do... So my strand of it, obviously, is about self-directed support and this this concept of let's shift let's shift power and control away from the state, away from institutions, to individuals and allow people to design their own lives with support from the state. You know, and I think this is a great. This is one of Simon's great, you know, sort of brilliant diagrams, sort of talking about you know how everything fits together and underneath it all, you know, is the kind of bedrock which is the community really. So that's what our mission's been over the last couple of years, really, in, in our consultancy work. Um, so the first thing we do is really shift conversations, I think is the key. So, so this, so I came across this diagram in Simon's work in the, in the noughties really, and about this con concept of people being the passive recipients of, of care, basically grateful recipients, you know, um, and, and that, that was my experience in many ways, you know, within that institutional setting, people were just were getting a service. It was done to them. It wasn't done with them. And it certainly wasn't done with them in control of that. Um, so, more latterly, the whole you know the premise of the work we've been doing is around let's 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 get people you know into the position where they're citizens. They, they people understand there's a, they make contributions. It's it's a it's a they are in control you know and underneath that are, are all the supports that you know the the funding, government, professionals, all that kind of stuff. But at the heart of it is people making their own decisions and designing their own lives. And I think this is a funny concept when you talk to people outside of social care, because everybody assumes they're going to have control of their lives. Everybody does have day-to-day -day control of their lives. But when you come into the social care sphere, you just find so many people have decisions made for them and they're stuck in settings that they don't want to be in and nobody's advocating for them. And their voices kind of get lost within the system, really. So, so our mission is really to try and turn that around, basically, and enable people to, to, to do that, really. So I worked in commissioning for quite a few years. Sometimes I'm a bit embarrassed to admit it. Um, but this, my take on commissioning systems was this, basically. Inside local government commissioning and NHS commissioning to a certain extent, you know, there's a lot of process. There's bureaucracy. There's procurement rules. There's, and there's a sort of, there's a series of models that kind of self-perpetuate. So, so you've, and, and it's almost like both relationships need to exist and that's why they continue. So care providers, traditional care providers, residential care providers, they need commissioners and commissioners need things to commission. So you end up with this sort of e this cycle, this ecosystem of just going round and round in circles. And, and I, I've been involved in this for years. I've seen contracts just getting renewed and we give them another label, you know, all oh, outcome based support uh, really. And you scratch under the surface and it's not really, it's just the same thing kind of commissioned again, really. So, so I was, you know, for me, it was a really frustrating work in commissioning. I did, I did what I could to unpick some of that system. But the problem is that most people don't take a direct payment. They don't, they don't take control of their support because direct payments can be difficult to manage, can be a bit bureaucratic, and some people don't want to be employers. And there's a whole raft of reasons why people don't take direct payments. So we know that still, on average, across England, most people get their services commissioned for them. And I would say that what's commissioned for people is broadly very narrow in terms of that, that range of home care, risk care, supported living, those kind of services, not 
not a real full breadth of of what people could be kind of doing really um so for me when we when when the care acts came out in 2014 i was working in commissioning and obviously following this principle around self-direction the care act started to talk about individual service funds as this kind of new mechanism for contracting flexible contracting and flexible commissioning which is basically this idea that an organization will hold your budget for you so you have an if you're eligible for care services rather than having to take it as a direct payment which is paid to you you can nominate an organization to hold the budget for you but with the, the same premise that that budget is your budget and you can use it creatively to design your support and design your life in the way you want it so so we started doing that in dorset where i am in 2015 we set some of that stuff up um and you know came across simon simon came across our work and kind of you know figured out that it was actually quite avant-garde for the time for, you know for local authority to be offering people this opportunity really to have their budget held by by an organization on their behalf so so we had some so we had some brilliant examples of that quite quickly of how people were using that money differently so they were coming in taking an isf and just really cutting across some of those systemic problems that exist in commissioning around barriers between provider organizations people were just decide and it's so simple it's stuff like people just on a commissioned arrangement had to go to day service every thursday but some days that individual didn't want to go to day service on a thursday they wanted to go on a tuesday wanted to change his support you would have to go back to the council and ask permission to get hold of a social worker and you know all this kind of stuff so he moved over to an isf and his support organization basically um who supports him at home would just make those changes for him so, so that he would say, I don't, I don't want to go to the day service on Thursday. And they'd phone up the day service and say, hey, we're going to just switch around. We've got, you know, we'll, we'll. and it was, it was that simple. It's really simple, basic stuff. But in social care, it just doesn't seem to happen like that in commission services. It's, it's complicated. So, so we're really passionate about individual service funds as this really, as a new and growing model of unlocking some of the inherent problems with commission services, basically. So, so we think they're really important. Um, mainly because it's about another way of providing choice and control for, for people and putting them in the heart of designing their own support. Um, we still know loads of people are on commission services. Um, and I checked the stats last time, it was about 70, 71.5% of people a couple of years ago are still getting a commission service, basically. But we know that people are way more innovative. I mean, if you listen to what Glyn's done with, his, with the peer support group, they're solving their own problems without the state intervention, basically, without needing that. So we know people are much better when they're allowed to just solve their own problems. So people using direct payments are incredibly creative actually. And often people use direct payments and they return money back to councils that they don't use because they don't need it. But if you ask the councils how many provider organizations they commission are returning unspent money, it's going to be zero. If you did a freedom of information request, I can guarantee across the whole country. So basically almost every pound that goes back to goes out to commissioned organizations stays in those commissioned organizations basically, which for me just doesn't seem right. I can't get I can't understand that. And I, I we run a small provider organization. So we know, you know, we, we know how things work basically. And there are always better ways of doing people's support if you can be if you're able to be creative. I think that's that's the bottom line really. And allowing allowing the, the support organization to work with that person and design the life that makes sense to them basically. That's the kind of key to it. So whereas councils will often set stuff up with a person and they'll walk away and you might not get a review for 12 months. You might not get a review for two years. You might not get a review for three years. So whatever that arrangement is set up three years ago is still running three years later. But I, I'm not the same person a year later, two years later, three three years later. We, we progress, we move on, but our systems and, and the bureaucracy can't can't kind of can't kind of make that work if you see what I mean. So 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 that's what we're all about: transferring control to individuals through this funding mechanism, basically. So that's so this is like the new vision for us. This is what this is what we're aiming at basically. Um, and if you're familiar with TLAP and um, things like that, personal and their website, they've got this community center support models, like Rainbow, um, and it's just all the cool stuff, all the great little organisations, all the great things that people are doing themselves in communities, all the all the kind of alternatives to that standardised residential care narrative, home care, blah 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 blah, that kind of stuff. So this is us. We think it's people commissioners and communities working together using budgets creatively to solve their own problems and, and design what they you know the local support that they want the supports they need locally basically and that's happening and it's really been driven by direct payments and again going back to i would have said most creativity in the commissioning ecosystem in my whole career has been driven by citizens using money creatively themselves not by commissioners basically and I'm sure we could have an argument there'd be some commissioners out there who would say they've done some creative stuff and i would agree there has been some stuff but 
broadly speaking, these innovations have popped up around commissioning rather than as a result of commissioning. So, so we're really passionate about trying to shift again the narrative towards people and communities solving their own problems, basically. So we know it's good, and we know it's what people want now because I think people, like I said, I spent years in commissioning, banging my head against the wall, going round and round in circles, doing the same stuff. There's a whole group of commissioners out there. When we speak to them, they're all saying the same thing. We've got to the end of what we can do within that that commissioning world. What can we do differently now? What can we do to shift choice and you know shift control over to citizens, but also they're interested in making things more efficient as well. And we know that when when people solve their own problems they tend to be more effective than when services solve problems and financially more efficient as well. So there's growing movement of local authorities that are starting to recognize this. So we've been lucky enough to work with quite, it's a growing number, it's almost, it's almost like exponentially growing as we're going around the country of organizations, local authorities and CCGs who are looking to do something different for the people in their area, basically to change this dynamic, change this discourse over to choice and control and funding and flexibility passed over to citizens to design their own supports, basically. So the best example, and the most exciting bit of work we're doing, I'd say, and I, I'm excited about all of those areas, I think it's amazing. Whenever commissioners talk to us, it's brilliant because it's like, a, it's like a sea change. It's like they've decided, they've run out of these ideas, let's try something new. And I think it's amazing that some of those, you know, those local authorities are now willing to start having these conversations because it's quite radical stuff still. And it's about trust and control and it's about, and it's about losing control you know, for, for those commissioners and allowing people and organisations to effectively design their own support away from commissioners really. Changes the role of commissioning massively. It makes, for me, it makes commissioners more market shapers or people who make sure that good services exist in their, in their area and they help connect people to those basically. So this is a little diagram. It's another one of Simon's brilliant diagrams around what that kind of looks like in practice. You know, person, family, setting the direction of travel, having their budget, getting good advice locally, community brokerage if that's available so that's people in communities who know what's out there they know the good stuff that's happening and helping connect people up so it's not always about paid support it's exactly about the whole concept of if you don't know so so what we've done with mechanized care over the years is we've we've removed we've made that a process of procurement and people have care packages bought for them when actually there are local solutions and people locally that might actually be willing to help those individuals they just don't get asked the question so 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 what we know is that in communities there's amazing wealth of, of kind of asset based and people out there who will you know literally would if you if you called them up and said can you help somebody they would but nobody calls them because we're so used to just defaulting to buying care for people basically so the whole shift for us is about putting a person in charge looking at how communities solve problems but also creating links between communities and social care so that there is actually some sort of joined up system around that so that people can access both things if they need it they can have kind of paid care if they require it but also they can look at other ways of solving some of their problems locally through their networks so this is what, so, so the best bit of work, and it is, for me, it's, it's so messy. And like people say to me, it's good that it's messy because it's co-production and that's absolutely true. So basically in Bristol, what we're trying to do is all of the voluntary and community social enterprise sector organizations in Bristol want, have signed up to almost a program called Make It Local, which is this concept of let's make supports for people local and keep money local as well. So there's two strands to it. It's about designing stuff that citizens want in their communities but also it's about keeping the Bristol pound in Bristol for, with, the, with the obvious economic benefits of that. So in the social care world, a lot of support organisations you're paying for, 20, 30% of that amount of money is going outside of your ecosystem. So wages and salary, maybe, you know, 70% for, for the worker locally. But the rest of that money flows out. So millions and millions of pounds, probably billions nationally, flows outside of those areas where that money where, where that work is hurt with where it's happening basically so bristol are commissioning services and so a lot of that money is going outside of bristol completely so the idea with making it local is to is to route money through to individuals and through the vcse connecting people to the care that they want and helping the vcse become and a series of steps and this is a big it's a big journey for the vcse which is why it's quite messy but it's amazing that they're, they're absolutely supportive of this so trying to fig figure out how we can bring the VCSE into the space of providing services as well. So we get the dual benefit of them being able to work with, they know locally what's happening. They know that what communities are up to, they can connect people up with volunteers, they can connect people with all that amazing, that peer support kind of stuff. But when people need a bit of paid support, they can also connect them up to people who will provide paid support for them. So that's the kind of mission in Bristol and it's to create and bear in mind these VCC organizations they don't do social care they do volunteering they're amazing at that and community building and covid response stuff has been incredible and the networks they've developed 
but we're trying to move them up from from volunteering into coordination and introducing people to local local small scale what we call micro enterprises like sole traders people who want to provide care at local level basically so the vcfc are, are kind of stepping in to do that so that that for me is a lot all going on at the same time so it's it's devolving the funding and control, moving the funding through the VCSC. And obviously a lot of these VCS organisations are having, we're, we're reliant on grant funding. And effectively the, the council is saying, we're going to stop the grant funding. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to help you come into the ecosystem so that we're going to create this sustainable funding model. And the VCSC organisations are really excited about this and also about the opportunity to invest their surplus. So that money that would have flowed as profit out to the big kind of corporates outside of Bristol, they're going to reinvest that money in community projects. So we're hoping to make like a whole a virtuous circle basically of investment in the VCC, people getting their support needs met locally and then that money kind of flowing back out. So that's a very whistle stop tour of one project because I'm conscious I was only supposed to talk for 10 minutes and I'm sorry, I've gone over, I knew I would. Um, <laughs> so I think it's just an open floor now in terms of if there's any questions or you guys want to talk about anything more detail or. Yeah, I've got a personal budget update at the moment. Mm -hmm. but it's i get it through social care mm -hmm. i have complex health conditions so i have like physical health problems as well mm -hmm. um and i to, to try and keep myself healthy i want to use my some of my budget towards paying for hydrotherapy because i can't go into a normal swimming pool because of you sure. know my temperature yeah. control yeah and um basically was told no you can't use it for that so like this person and, and i know some areas are better than others yeah um but i found like in doncaster we're supposed to have sort of like a health and social care budget so it's like a you know the the, the joint sort of budget but when i sort of tried to get one i was told well you won't be entitled to one because you're not you know your health isn't poorly enough so I can get social care, but I can't ca get the healthcare part of the budget. So therefore, I can pay for like a support worker to to support me with with social activities and and you know personal care and stuff. But I can't use it to keep myself healthy and well, mm -hmm. which sort of is, seems a bit silly. Yeah. And and you know to me it doesn't make any sense because it's a a wasting my my health and my life because I'm trying to keep myself well and I, I'm you know but I keep getting barriers put in the way to try and do that when, when you're trying to access social care and I, I'm sure there's loads of people like me out there who, who, who you know have the same issue I mean quite apart from the fact that as you said having to be a, you know become an employer because having a personal budget you're sort of responsible for all the paperwork which I tend to struggle with anyways <laughs> um you know, isn't isn't easy. So it, it is just a minefield, and and surely there's got to be easier ways, like you said, to try and and work around those issues to make it, you know, best for everyone concerned. Really. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think there's you may. I mean, some the points are amazing, really. So that's that artificial health and social care divide, which is ridiculous, and also if you're eligible, this is a misnomer sometimes with with people who have health funding. They're told they can't use it for social care when it's not true. So if you're eligible for health funding, you can use it for health and social care. So there's some stuff around. I don't think a lot of commissioners understand the law that well, if I'm honest with you. The more I kind of work outside of that space, the more I realise that's kind of a, a, a problem, really. Um, and so, and I think that means what they'll also say is they'll put unlawful restrictions on how you use a personal budget. Yeah. The Care Act's really clear. And there's loads of case law. There's loads of health and social care ombudsman rulings about this, where the count is called fettering of discretion. And if a council creates a policy or says, or basically overstretch, you have a right effectively to, to design your own support to meet your own outcomes. And that personal budget is supposed to help facilitate that. If the council interferes in that process, effectively they're over, they're overreaching their powers basically. And that there's loads of examples where that's gone through complaints process to health and social care ombudsman has gone through judicial review and they've been kind of pulled up on it, but it still happens. And it's really annoying for me. So, you know, so for me, it's that message. We always put out the message of like, you know, talk to Cascade, talk to Belinda Schwer, talk to some of those charities. And, and if you feel there's some, if the council's stopping you, you know, using your own discretion around that budget, 
then you know f- go go get some support legally i know there's charities out there that help people kind of make those challenges and we we, we send quite a few people that way but it's just annoying it's because it's based on a bit of ignorance really um, yeah, so that's... But it's also the 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 um the the inconsistency from you know from one council to another exactly right i mean yeah, i used to help, help run a, a, a support group a peer, peer-led support group in wakefield mm-hmm. and you know, people in Wakefield were able to use the budget for the personal budgets for all sorts of things, including going on holiday, for instance, you, you, you know, yeah. and, and so it's sort of like you, you, you sort of get to thinking, well, why is there such disparity between different areas, you, you know, when theoretically, you, you know, the, the, the care and the, the, the services you, you, you are given should be identical you know it should be equal for everyone who accesses you know you need to access services and yet there's still no consistency across sort of the different areas and um it, it's just yeah it's it just seems a minefield yeah it's a complete minefield I completely agree. I mean it's an absolute postcode lottery and it's weird though because the care act and the and the NHS guidance around personal budgets is really clear so there's some real clarity there's real national it's like a national guideline, but every area has just interpreted it slightly differently and has built little ecosystems around that, which is just not very helpful, you know, to citizens really. So our, a big part of our work really is to help shift their thinking around this stuff and try and challenge some of those perceptions around what budgets can and can't be used for. Because it, again, when the state interferes in, it's overreaching and it's inefficient. And, you know, and I'm sure, you know, we know people are much better at solving their own problems. Um, so, so that is a big part of it. And, but I think the good thing is that I think there's an appetite, a growing appetite from commissioners to get better at this stuff, but it's just painfully slow. And it's not, you know, in many ways, it's, you know, it's exhausting for people. And I think I talk to a lot of families around this. We give out advice to people quite often. Um, and the system just wears people down. So they, and also people just don't know their own rights. So the other part of it is us trying to help people get, understand their own rights so they know when to challenge, when, when, somebody, when they're told something that's not right. People, often people just accept it. So, so that's the other part of it, really. Can I ask, Chris, um, is Bristol very well invested in their voluntary sector infrastructure? Yeah, they are, actually. They are. They're very well invested. So how, how does that... How, in, uh, do they have lots of um, uh, sets? Yeah, no, explain how, uh, yeah, how, so how they do it. Yeah, they've got a very strong network of voluntary and community sector organisations that are almost geographically based. They've got two sets of uh, in the VCC really. They've got the sort of geographic community hubs almost um, that cover Bristol localities, and then they have like three non-geographic like equalities organisations. So they've got Black South West okay. Network, Age UK, which is Bristol Age UK, it's not the national one, and they've got West of England Centre for Independent Living. And then underneath that, you've actually got your, your real community guys like BS3, Southmead, the guys that are on the ground doing that kind of stuff. And together, they're an amazing combination in terms of like that knowledge of, uh, you know, people rooted in community, but also the equalities guys who really understand certain demographics, if that makes sense. Um, and putting, bringing them together into this project has been, been amazing, really. So, What I, what I think is, is the, the real problem that we all share is this uh, is that um, you have the big providers who are centrally funded and um, very well funded in the main, and then you have the little guys who you know are scratching around for breadcrumbs basically, and always lose out to the big guys, and I I, I can't see any way of getting around that because central funding is always going to remain central funding um and and they will go towards the big guys so how how do we uh, how do we address this we address it we address it by people power and and i I think think glenn is actually probably a good good um example of this because he runs a peer support group and they get supported by, by local, you know, by, by, this, um, by Ardash and, and, you know, service providers. A lot of small, small organisations of, you know, support groups, community-led support groups can't get access to funding. They're not big enough to bid for, for any contracts, you, you know, and they end up 
often getting used by the larger organizations who, who you know, maybe pass the, the really complex cases onto the, the peer, you know, the peer support groups at the bottom yeah. who do all the work. Yeah. get no funding for it you, you, you know and that I, th I, I, I mean I've been um, to like uh, meetings with CWP and we've brought this up because we found with the work you know work providers they used to do that a lot as well so and I think that happens quite a lot where the large providers are bidding for, bidding for the contracts they're getting the contracts and then they um, sort of pass client you know they they get the bulk money and then pass clients on to small organizations to support them and smaller organizations because the values are different for us we do it because we want to help people yeah. potentially you know so so we don't like to charge for for, for things you, you know when we know people can't afford it and and so you end up getting used so glenn, glenn might be able to advise how to best go about trying to get um, you know, better working relationships with service providers? Well, the best way to do it is get lots of organisations like yourselves with the same values and same principles and create an alliance. Create a voice. Be stronger together. Got all the people who have the similar views to you, similar ethos, same, similar principles, similar values. Get them all in the room and say, not in my name. No more. No more will I put up with this. No more will we use as a dumping site for all the crap in society and expect us to do, jump uh, jump for roots when you said jump. It's about it's about getting all this. So we've got now, we've got Staying for, for All, we've got uh, Women's Phoenix Aid, we've got uh, Edlington Old Talk, and various other organisations where we come together like a big club and, and bid as one. And all say which part of that process that we'll we'll do and, and we'll deliver on. So together we're stronger, we've got a louder voice. So that means they have to listen to us now. We're not a lone wolf. We're not stood on our own in the corner. We've got lots of powerful people behind us who are now worked in services, who want to give peer support in our organisation and come back after retirement because to realise that's what they came in to work for it at the very beginning about people wanting to help people not stuck behind a desk pulling forms in. So it's about reuniting within everyone what the passions are, what the love, what supports, what, what the need is, what makes you get out of bed in the morning. Why is it, why, why is it acceptable for my son, daughter, brother, sister, cousin, auntie, mother, grandma, granddad, to have a worse service than you. It's not. It doesn't matter whether I'm black, blue, Chinese, Christian, Jewish. Why should I have a worse service because I'm a be a, I be a me community? No, you shouldn't. But unless we stand together and say this, and I'll be at one voice together, nobody has to listen. So that's what I would say in every community or in every town and every city that you're based in, right? Find, find the credible communicators. Find the people like you. Find the irritants in your community. Find the people that are bold and courageous who don't care about asking the questions. And stand united together and deliver something together. We run, we, we, we uh, went for safe space, safe space, is the only peer-led crisis service in England. Yeah, we work in partnership with Ardash, but all our, the people who man the phones are all peers, people with lived experience, people who've been through the system, right? Not paid members of staff, people who've been there and done it and wore a T-shirt on many times, who stopped going around the squirrel cage of service, treatment, doctor, crisis, hospital, tablets, and, and for many years. You've got to have the people, people that are passionate about it. Passion's 90% of everything we do. If you haven't got that passion, you might as well just put your pen down, your paper and go home. Because it's about, it's that desire to make things better. And the thing about, I mean, I don't get paid. I'm not getting, I'm not, I'm not getting paid. I mean, because I want to make life better for people like me, who, who were exciting services like me, who never had a voice. 
I mean, to get on these different structures, on these the different meetings, you need to become visible within your community. Okay? And you also need to stop apologising for who you are. I know your organisation is. I know the people that you're standing up for and the carers and, and, and the people within the communities who are written off, who are, who are traumatised every single day by institutional services that keeps them oppressed, that keeps them down, right? That doesn't give them a voice. You are that conduit. You are that miracle they've been looking for. Be that miracle. Mm. I hope that's okay. Daniel, what do you think? I think you should go into politics. I'd vote for you for Prime Minister <laughs> every day over our current government. I shouldn't say that we're recording it. Please I think feed some, feed some back about what we've been saying. When we, that's what yeah, no, I, I, think, I think this is... Um, I think you're all right. Um, but I think we're also missing... I feel like we're missing the heart of the problem is that we, and this is my interpretation of it, is that we're a little bit stuck, aren't we, in the same mental model of it's about services and yes. receiving a service. It's about money. It's yeah. about who's got the budget and how it's commissioned and how it's procured and how efficient it is. And I think we just need to like pause and go, we're now at the point in this country where the system as is, is basically delivering bad outcomes, bad help for people, is trapping people in services. Yeah. It's crap for the people it's trying to help. And this isn't just about social care, it's about the criminal justice system, it's about yeah, the health system. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's crap for those receiving care, it's crap for those that are delivering it. I'm working in it. And so who's it serving? And we know that demand for all of that support and help is going to go up and it's going to cost money. So we maybe we need to just think radically differently about how this works in the future and I think Glyn and, and I'm serious about I'd vote for you for Prime Minister because I think it has to be driven on a new set of values and principles where trust connectivity human connection is the future currency that it's that it's driven by not how efficient it is or how lean it is or how many people it can reach and so we just I think we need to just like completely shift the way we think about this and, you know, some really interesting kind of pockets of examples of um, kind of local authorities experimenting with doing things differently and breaking the rules. And there was one, and I can't remember where it's from, where actually they got the kind of um, council tax collectors to kind of think differently and see that as a signal that a family might be struggling. And instead of just phoning them up and saying, where's your council tax you haven't paid? They'd phone them up and go, are you all right? What's going on? And it would be a, an hour and a half conversation that all of a sudden surfaced all of these other issues that is driving their inability to serve the council tax. But again, that insight is just hugely valuable about how you can support an individual and family. So what if we actually started driving and designing the future of the system around that com type of conversation, yes. that connectivity, rather than money efficient? Do you know, does that make sense? And so I think we just need to, to stop and reframe the whole thing because it's broken. It doesn't work for anyone. How can the system make us better when the system's sick itself? We need but to the, stop looking at systems and create his own system. Well, Forget about I, their system, that's their system. Right, well, leave them to it. Exactly, oh. exactly. But then who is the system? The system is a collection of individuals. And so if we start to say the system isn't serving the people that it, that it forms part of, let's just stop and go, well, let's redesign it with the people. Yeah. And so it's a generally people-driven, people-powered system. Be a blank canvas, though. We start again from scratch. Not, not start bending over the road. I think, I think we have to stop tinkering at the edges and go. You know, start again. That's why Megan's here, a social worker in the system, couldn't handle it. He probably even cracked her up, and now she's become a sort of support worker, and she worked in it. Megan, Meg. Well, yeah. I mean, I'm really reliving all my old frustrations listening to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite, it's quite an interesting process for me. And I'm so glad that I left and I'm so glad that I did something else and now I'm going back into it in another route because I'm going to be working with adults with learning disabilities again, but in a different context. And it's in a, what they call in around here, it's a social firm. It's a little, a little organic farm. And I think it's a real chance to make a difference. And I mean, I feel very lucky because I saw the, the system as it was and I saw it didn't work. And I felt the frustrations of the people that I worked for, I mean, as in, the clients and 
I was just like always fighting it. And in the end, I crossed so many people with swords with so many people. I mean, it just wasn't sustainable for me to carry on. So I think I understand both. I think you're right, Glenn, about standing up and really being empowered to say what you think. This is ridiculous. We're not having it anymore. No way. There's no reason why you should get services here and I shouldn't over here. But I think also, Daniel, you're right, because the system is pretty broken and fixing it from what is already currently there is like um, just putting yet another patch. That's the danger. It will just be another sticking plaster on top. Just letting everybody know it says we have 30 seconds. Yeah. Do we have to go out? Do they bring us back, Chris? They bring us back. Yeah, I think we just teleport. Eight seconds, seven seconds. Please feed some of it back, everybody. Please feed some.